Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. Now this week we are joined by Mr. Blake Sampson. Hello, I'll be asking the questions and potentially answering a few that I can. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So it's a good opportunity to hunker down and take some stock of what is going on in mountain biking tech. Now, if you have a question of your own that you want answered, please get in the comments using the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and hopefully one of us can answer it at some point. Hey, yeah, one of us. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Right, <laughs> on with the show. First question coming in, it is Cookie Crisp Yeet says, how do you measure rear travel? Does it differ between linkage designs and is it very accurate? I have no idea how to measure. I just get told on the box and then I say yes. <laughs> well, if you think about how, um, as the rear axle goes up into its stroke and obviously the suspension will be compressing conversely, it will, um, it will basically draw a line and it's that line that you're measuring. Okay. Now, often it's at a curve, it's not straight, so the curvature would affect the amount of travel. Apparently, some people say it's quite negligible, um, but I have seen some rather complicated jigs that say if you want to measure it accurately, you know, it is quite a, quite a big operation. Although I have heard of people, you know, attaching like a pencil, they take the wheel out, put a pencil through the dropouts, and then kind of drawing on a piece of cardboard oh, and measuring okay. that. Um, but what's interesting is actually the way that we classify bikes is sometimes you know, all too often things are conveniently 140 or 160 mil of travel. And often that can be way out, you know. Mm. I've heard of some bikes that say they're 160 coming in at closer to 170 and, and vice versa. Um, so I think how accurately we measure it is one thing. How accurately we then label it is, is another. Is another, <laughs> yeah. But, um, so yeah, they do differ between the link designs because as well, if you think of the, a single pivot, it's gonna have, um, you know, it, it's only got, got kind of a quite easy axle path to predict. But if you think of something like a Yeti, which has got that switch infinity or like a polygon, where actually the, the bottom of the bike is moving yeah, it out and over itself. Exactly, yeah. and, and VPPs and stuff come in. So it does depend on the um, on the axle okay. path as much as anything. But it's quite hard. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Hopefully that answers your question. We've got one here <laughs> from Matt. It says, my Fox 36 forks are due a service. Will a lower leg service be sufficient for another year or should I really be spending more for to be done professionally. So doing a lot more, do the whole fork itself, we'll just do the lowest. Well, I mean, like everything, single motorbikes, we're just talking about this actually, you know, service intervals at enough hours. Mm. Now a mountain bike is a real strange thing because you could have like a downhill bike that you are absolutely smashing in the park, but you could spend, stand on a lift queue, go up on the lift and have a five minute downhill one compared to a trail bike, which you might mm. be going at slower speeds, but constantly, constantly going working. through its strength. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I would, Try and estimate, you know, think if you ride, say if you ride five hours a week, then you can work out roughly the amount of um, hours per year. I think what's going to happen is with your, you know, if something goes internally really bad in terms of the damper, it kind of becomes quite apparent quite quickly. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can actually, pre, you know, pre preempt that it needs a service and it, and it can avoid those sort of issues because nothing worse than something failing on you. Half, you know, half we can probably people. cost a lot more. Yeah, exactly. Especially if something really goes badly wrong and you haven't serviced it, it's just pfft. yeah, it's a nightmare. So I'd say lower legs definitely. It's a really good thing to do, and if you can get away with doing an air leg service, which is relatively simple, and we've done on the channel before, then those are two really good things. And the sealed damper might actually be a bit that that is a send away job, but those two other jobs can actually really keep on top a lot of maintenance that forks require. There you go. Um, what's the next question? Question coming in from Johnny says, why are modern sized small MTBs larger than older sized smalls? So that is a really, yeah, again, a really good question. I mean, it depends how we size mountain bikes because the thing that actually has probably stayed reasonably constant over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. even though the way we've designed and built bikes has become very different, is effective top tube. So the distance between your saddle and your handlebars. Mm -hmm. Now what's happened is, although these parts have stayed the same, the front wheels moved far that way. further. <laughs> and the, 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 the saddles moved further forward. Yeah. And so the wheels have just kind of gone, run away from each yeah. other. And subsequently the wheelbases have got longer. So when you're sat down often, you know, for instance, a polar medium is standing up because of the large reach figure. Mm -hmm. It is only, I think it's five mil difference from my reactor. Oh wow. But sat down because it's far steeper yeah. than the seat tube angle. It's not actually a comfortable bike for me to ride and I would be on a large. Mm. Because as, as bike seat chip angles get steeper, they just eat into the reach number so much for your seated, you know, your climbing position. Um, similarly, if you think that as um, handlebars get slacker, they come further back. Yeah, they do, yeah. So the, the, 
you know, I mean, how much it's changed varying from um, this particular the trans to trans, I mean, there's also going to be things like um, stem, mm -hmm. handlebar width, etc. But largely, the, you know, going between a cross country bike with a massive long stem but quite a short reach, yeah. compared to an aggressive trail bike, the contact points are actually similar dimensions apart from each other. Yeah. Um, so I hope that helps. That hope, yeah, it's not hope. exact science, but that's yep. kind of the trend. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That's why bikes sometimes are now. The smalls have got like 450 reach sometimes, yeah. which is a large couple of years ago. Which is a large couple of years ago. Yeah. But that's just technology just moving on throughout yeah. the ages. And, and when, when one part gets steeper, you know, like everything's a compromise. So as, as one part gets, if an angle is coming into a set measurement, then it's going to reduce that measurement. Yeah. And it's all going to be balanced out. Yeah, it has to. But yeah, that's a very long answer. <laughs> long walk for a short drink. Yeah. I hope you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> Now this next question is coming in from Steve Webb, it's quite long. It's all about mullet bikes, and I've ridden a few, you like a mullet bike. The question is, do you think a mullet bike setup is worth doing on a 26 inch bike? I.e. putting a 27.5 on the front and a 26 on the rear. I have a 2013 Mondrega June XR, and it has a 26 inch wheels in it. It has a 180 mil front and 160 on the rear. Uh, I can't afford a new bike, but I'm interested in mud, mud bike setup by changing the forks, maybe a 170 travel to compensate for a bigger wheel on the front. Uh, your thoughts? Now, I, I, I think it can be done, but it yeah. might mess around. You might need to get some cups on your, like, what do you call them? Offset cups, yep. maybe, just to slacken that bike out a little bit. Um, I think it's doable. Yeah, I mean, start with the Mondraker, it's probably a bike that was quite progressive designed anyway. So it's quite slack in the metal at the yeah. time. And, and it sounds like Steve's going about it the right way. He's thinking, well, if I'm going to basically increase the height on the front due to a larger wheel, mm. I should probably do something to decrease it with fork travel. Yeah. And, you know, I think there is no reason, it seems kind of nonsense to me that we, we're at, we're, there should ever be a conversation to say that bikes have to have the same wheel size. Mm. That's just, for instance, the way it has been, but yeah. there's no reason the way it should. There's no reason the bike can't be really good in a mother setup. I think what, what people were doing when they originally wanted to experiment with mullets is by alternating the wheel size, you can drastically slacken out your geometry. Now it is going to compromise other things like seat chip angle, etc. But what I think is really interesting is if you can keep your axle to crown height the same, mm -hmm. so basically, you know, that largely affects where your handlebars are and your head angle, then there's no necessarily, it's going to kind of isolate the problem, or sorry, the, the, the complications to the front wheel. I think it sounds like you're thinking about it. And I say nothing ventured, nothing gained. Mm, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I think you're probably going to find, if you wanted to say get some new forks anyway, you're probably going to find your options are quite limited to get a good aggressive fork that's not a dirt jumping fork, a trail fork, an enduro yeah. fork, and a 26 anyway. So what you could do is you could get the 650B fork and basically either have the benefit of increased mud clearance <laughs> and then experiment with them um, yeah. with it in, in time. I mean, yeah. it's, it's funny, eh? Like, it seems to have come, been this huge, unleashing and I, I totally understand why people want, want to do the mullet. If you can keep your axle to crown similar, because what's going to happen, we are talking about earlier on, is seat chip angles could, could, be or could go out the back. Could go out the back door and yeah. climbing a, a mullet bike is... Yeah, because you, you had the strive in a mullet. I had the strive in a mullet bike, yeah, and climbing it was, um, oh yeah, it was worse than, yeah. It was yeah. great going down, hmm. going up. I think it's super interesting that we're going to see this next wave of mullet bikes that are, are built on a mullet platform. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, there have been brands kicking around doing it for a while, but like kind of, you know, the big players are specialised to actually, you know, your Scots, etc. Because that's going to, I think, really, really bring what, what it can. It's going to reach its potential. Yeah. When at the moment, I think sometimes it's like a sticking plaster. Mm -hmm. It's like, put a, put a smaller way in the back and suddenly you've got the head angle you want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, you know. Do you know, I've only seen it mostly in downhill racing. Mm on gravity fed bikes. Yeah. I don't, right. You don't see it on a trail bike as much. E-bikes, no. yes, mm -hmm. but you've got the power of that motor to help you. Uh, but trail bikes, I don't know. Yeah, because do you think you go for, sorry it's gone a massive tangent here, but yeah. I think it's quite interesting because you ride, well, very hard. Would you think you'd ever go for a 29 inch downhill bike? And would you worry about um, wheel clearance on, on your backside? I would stick with 27.5. Yeah, because yeah. I sometimes get tagged on longer travel 29ers. Yeah. On, on the old caboose. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't want it too much, no, especially when you're going through some something sketchy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What's but the next question? Let's have a look. So it's from Mike, Meek, 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 and they say, uh, so why do people run a wider tire up front for added grip? And they've basically been asking themselves if they could run a wider tire at the back 
and that'd be more effective on a hardtail because it'd be more com comfortable, it would give you more confidence, and it would play a role in adding some cushioning and basically make it faster descending. Mm. Now you've run a load of hardtails. I run hardtails, yeah, I love, I love a hardtail. Mm. Um, I go for a very wide tire on a hardtail, mm. only because I get in, you know, like he's saying, you get the extra cushioning on the rear. Mm. Uh, I would run both front and rear. They, on the front, I guess I do run a, a wider tire on my trail bike. Mm. Uh, just so I can get extra grip there, and then on the rear it's fast rolling. Yeah. So more grip on the front because you're doing a lot more steering on the front, yeah. more so than the rear. The rear is just gonna step yeah. out. But yeah, that's right. Yeah, go with that. Because we're with bikes, you know, we like you said that the the demands on the front wheel are very large, mm -hmm. huge amount of braking forces, turning forces, yeah. as well as cornering forces. I think what's also interesting is as riders we do tend to favor a bike that essentially oversteers. Yeah. That is a lot more comfortable to wrestle yeah. than a bike that wants to, not, if not, to understeer yeah. and not turn, you know? Exactly. So um, front wheel grip is definitely um, definitely a, th a really good thing. And in relation to your question, there's no reason why you can't have your cake and eat it too. No, exactly. You can have the comfort of a big tire on the back and there's no reason why you can't do that on the front. No, yeah. And um, it's only gonna, for me, I would, I'm a big fan of that. You know, no, I'm a big fan of it. Big fan of it. Um, now, we have a question from Sam Millwood and he says, does brake rotor size make a difference? Yes. Yeah. Now I've you've ridden Andy Specifico. Mm -hmm. I've ridden Andy Specifico. I ran it with a one. Well, it was a very small disc, one eighty mm -hmm. front and rear. Oh yeah. And being descending a lot, they do heat up very quickly, yes. and braking <laughs> becomes hard. Yeah. Your brakes start to feel woody. It's sent. They don't start. To, they stop working. Whereas if you run a two or three on the front and on the rear. Like, you know, the heat dissipation going through that caliper and through that disc is going to be far superior than a 180 mil. So it's all about heating up a brake. Yeah, totally. I mean, there, there can be different things to uh, play in terms of, you know, how how much heat ends up going through your brake, such as riding style. It's a massive one. I think sometimes brakes come into the flak that sometimes isn't necessarily their fault. Like if, if you ride on quite a small hill, mm. and you've got some big downhill stoppers and you're saying, well, these are pumping up. It's yeah. often because people are riding them a bit too much. Yeah. And they're, they're, you have already on them more often. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so if you imagine a wheel spinning, spinning and you've got your, you know, your axle and your rim, they're both spinning at the same RPM. But obviously, the rim is essentially traveling further distance because it's further away from the axle. Now, what that means is that as you get um, further away from the axle, i.e. run bigger rotors, the braking track is essentially getting longer. Yeah. So there are kind of more opportunities for the caliper to work upon it. Um, and like you said, you know, heat dissipation is a massive one. I think that, that that's the biggest. But often I think there are sometimes um, people have concerns that when they go to a, a rotor that's essentially actuating more leverage on the hub, it's going to be very bitey mm -hmm. and black modulation. But actually because it has a longer length per rotation, to work on, yeah. it actually often doesn't. And I think, you, for me, I think you get, you know, 203s, go to 220s, you can still get great feeling brakes that have loads of modulation. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't just become a light switch, no. bam, lock. So um, yeah, there's that too. And, you know, especially you look at the, the downhill guys now, a lot of them are going for 220s, but what's interesting is some of them are running 220s, but only on the back, just, just for the heat dissipation. Wow, yeah, look at that. Yeah, so I think it's a really interesting topic. I actually spoke to somebody who's basically the head of a very big company that makes very, very nice brakes. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that his, their frustration is they make these very, very powerful brakes and then people want to run either lighter rotors or smaller rotors. And he was just saying, you want as much material there as possible to get rid of the heat because heat yeah. is your main, your main adversary. So I hope that answers your question a bit. Um, now the last question is actually a really good question for you, Blake. Oh. And it's from blah, blah, it's a bit, off script for tech, because it's more about riding in general, but I thought yeah. you'd be the perfect person to ask. And they say, does picking up another type of cycling offer skill sets that may have a noticeable effect on mountain bike performance, e.g. BMX for bike control or road bike for fitness? I think it does, yeah. Um, you're saying about BMX, dirt jumping, if you were to start off dirt jumping, you learn a lot from a dirt jumper. Yeah. Whereas you can be a lot smoother because you're, uh, you gaining, well, you're learning about pumping, mm -hmm. whereas if you're just to ride trail, you're just bimbling along. Mm -hmm. But if you were to do pump track or BMX or riding a BMX track on a mountain bike, you're learning pumping, you're learning jumping, you're learning all those fundamental skills that you need to transfer over onto trail. Mm -hmm. So using other disciplines to gain those skills to bring over to just trail riding is, yeah, it does work. And if you had your time again, and you were, well, you were a young lad actually, mm -hmm. 
and you, I'm sure you want to, like all mountain bikers, probably want to get your children to mountain bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What discipline would you gently nudge them towards? I'd just, I'd chuck them on a don't jump bike. Mm. Yeah, a hard tail. I uh, just let them, mm. yeah, do the fundamental things. Yeah, but you hear so, about so many great riders like Chris Hoyster on BMX. I think BMX is a really good way to go. It is. To, I started on BMX. Yeah, to you know, gating, bike yeah. control, and yeah. then you know, because as a five-year-old. Fitness probably isn't that much of a deal anyway. Yeah. But I mean, I think for me, like coming from someone that started on the other end of the spectrum, when I started on road bikes to mountain bikes, boy, it shows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but so, I, yeah, yeah, going from smooth to rough is yeah. But I yeah. still love getting out on the road bike, yeah. and I think it does help, especially mm-hmm. for it longer does. riding. It does, yeah. No, you can learn a lot from road cycling, whereas you, you know you gain your uh, what do you call it? Car- base, cardio, base fitness, base and, fitness, yeah, yeah. long sim- distance. Similarly, pump track skills yeah. are something that, you know, I don't think most mountain bikers practice enough. No. It's great to see more trail centres come with them you know, near the car park exactly. and mess around. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, good, all bike time is good bike time. As far it as is, it is. But that is it for this week's Ask GMBN Tech. Thank you very much for joining us. No, no, thank you, Henry. Kind of through the window here, <laughs> looking glassy. <laughs> now, guys, if you've got your own question, please get in the comments using the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Yes. And hopefully we can answer it. Any question is viable. <laughs> no silly questions. Goes. Yeah, anything goes. <laughs> anything goes except silly questions. Except. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, and we'll see you next time. See ya.